George Stinney Jr. was an African-American boy who was just 14 years old when he was convicted of murdering two young girls. George was then put to death via the electric chair and became the youngest American to be sentenced to death and executed in the 20th century. But there was a catch. George Stinney Jr. didn't kill those two girls, and 70 years later he was exonerated. Unfortunately, it was 70 years too late. George Stinney Jr. was born on October 21, 1929 to parents George Stinney Sr. and Mother Ain. He had four siblings, John who was three years older than George Jr who I will be referring to as George for the remainder of the video, Charles, who was two years younger, Catherine, who was four years younger, and Aim, who was seven years younger. The Stennys lived in Alkalu, South Carolina. George Sr. worked at the local sawmill and the family lived in company housing, as was typical of small southern towns back then. Alkalu, white and black residents were segregated. Different schools, different churches, and the neighborhoods were separated by railroad tracks that ran through. In 1944, George was 14 years old. It was this year that Betty June Binnaker and Mary Emma Thames were found dead. 11-year-old Betty June Binnaker and 7-year-old Mary Emma Thames hadn't arrived home on March 22, 1944. George Sr. had been involved in the search, along with hundreds of other Alkalu residents. The next day, their bodies were found in a soggy ditch on the African-American side of Alkalu. After hearing that piece of information, I'm sure you can guess where this is going. The girls had been beaten with a weapon of sorts, speculated to either be some sort of blunt metal object or railroad spike. The girls had gone missing after going on a mission to look for flowers. They had last been seen riding their bicycles and had passed the Stinney home on their way. While passing, Betty and Mary asked George and his little sister, Aim, if they knew where to find Maypops, commonly known as passion flowers. Aim would later be George's alibi for the time that the police had estimated that Betty and Mary had been murdered. But regardless of that, the town sheriff soon announced that George had been arrested after he confessed and led officers to a hidden piece of iron. Betty and Mary were examined by Dr. Ashbury Cecil Bozard, and their injuries were quite horrific. Both girls had suffered severe trauma to the face and head, but there was no sign of a struggle. Mary had a hole that went straight through her forehead into her skull, and a large cut above her eyebrow. Betty had suffered at least seven blows to the head, specifically targeting the back of her head. Dr. Bozard noted where the blows had occurred that her skull was nothing but a mass of crushed bones. The conclusion after the autopsy was concluded was that the injuries to Mary and Betty had been caused by a round instrument about the size of a head of a hammer. It goes without saying that in 1944, all police had to go on was hearsay and witness evidence. There were no cameras or digital records of where people had been. A rumor had also gone around Alkalu that Betty and Mary also stopped by another home one that belonged to a prominent white family on the same day of the murder, but this wasn't ever confirmed. Why would it have been confirmed, though? The police weren't looking at the possibility of a white killer being responsible for the murder. After learning that the girls had passed by the Stinney home, Clarendon County officers went straight there. George was handcuffed and then interrogated for multiple hours without any parent, an attorney, or outside witnesses. The only people who know what went on in the room are George and the officers who were there, and with that, it becomes whose word do you believe more. Like I said earlier, the sheriff said that George confessed to the murder. George also apparently said he did this after he tried to have sex with one of the girls. H.S. Newman, a Clarendon officer, wrote a handwritten statement that read the following. I arrested a boy by the name of George Stinney. He then made a confession and told me where to find a piece of iron about 15 inches long. He said he put it in a ditch about 6 feet from the bicycle. George Stinney was kept from his family from the time that he was arrested until the time he was executed. In fact, his parents were only able to visit him once during this time. His sister, Aim, would say in a 2014 interview that the last time she saw her brother alive, she was 77 years old in 2014. Eight-year-old Aim had been hiding in the chicken coop as two black vehicles approached their home. Her mom and dad were both out at the time, presumably working. Some officers stepped out, all of whom were white, and they arrested George and Aim's stepbrother Johnny. The boys were handcuffed and placed into the vehicles. Aim would see Johnny again as he was let go. George was not so lucky. Aim was George's shadow. She idolized her older brother and would follow him everywhere he went. The last thing she ever said to George was, Oh George, are you leaving me? Where are you going? George just told Aim to go find Charles and Catherine and tell them he has been taken away. I never saw him again until he was in his casket, Aim recalled. That is something I will always see in my memories. His face was burned. H.S. Newman wouldn't tell any of the family or others where George was being kept. His trial was fast approaching and despite him being only 14, 
This was considered the age of responsibility at the time. George's trial began roughly a month after Betty and Mary's deaths. It took place at a Clarendon County courthouse, and though George did have a court-appointed attorney, a man named Charles Plowden, he was offered little help in defending the charge against him. Charles Plowden didn't call any witnesses to the stand. He didn't present any evidence that would try to prove George's innocence, and most importantly, he didn't question George's alleged confession, of which there was no written record of. George Stinney was alone, facing a jury of 12 white men, and knowing that there was a mob of around 1,500 people outside the courthouse. I can only imagine what he was feeling at the time. Even if you aren't familiar with deliberation, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that it is generally a fairly lengthy process. On the short end, it can take a few hours. On the longer end, it can take days. The deliberation for George's verdict took less than 10 minutes. He was found guilty of capital murder, and the jury offered no recommendation for mercy. This verdict was given on April 24, 1944, just over a month after the girls had been found. George's parents were only able to see their son once, and that was after the trial, while he was at Columbia Penitentiary. They left his meeting convinced that their son was innocent, but their feelings weren't going to change anything. My mother cried and prayed, Ames said. We wanted the truth to come out, but sometimes, when you don't have the means and the money, you accept things for what they are. The NAACP tried to stop it, but it was no use. In those days, when you were white, you were right. When you were black, you were wrong. Everybody didn't just roll over and accept George's faith, though. South Carolina organizers on behalf of both white and black ministerial unions attempted to petition Governor Olin Johnston to grant George clemency due to his age. Hundreds of people also sent in letters to the governor's office, also asking for mercy. Despite every angle tried, nothing worked, and on June 16, 1944, George was executed at the South Carolina State Penitentiary. At the time of his death, George was a small-framed boy. He weighed just 95 pounds. The electric chair had been designed with men in mind, not small boys. The state electrician had a hard time adjusting electrode to George's right leg, and the mask worn in executions was too big for him. It was still placed over his face, however. When asked if he had any last words, George replied, No, sir. You don't want to say anything about what you did, the man asked. No, sir, George replied. Then 2,400 volts of electricity were sent through George's small frame. This caused the mask to slip off and it revealed the young boy's face with scarred open eyes and tears coming down. Saliva was dribbling from his mouth. Two more jolts followed and George was gone. 83 days later, let that amount of time sink in. It had been 83 days from when George was charged with murder to when he was executed. George Sr. had been fired after his son was arrested and whispers of an angry mob were wafting through the small town, so the only option was to leave. The Stennies first settled in nearby Pinewood and later moved to Sumter. Charles also later spoke in an interview with his surviving siblings. He described his parents as helpless. They had no money. The law was against them and they were black in the American South in 1944. Charles left Sumter for the Air Force before becoming Bishop of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ in Brownsville, Brooklyn. The siblings would all end up moving north and settling in either New York or Newark, New Jersey. They have little spoken of what happened all those years ago before 2014, and AIM has never been back to Alkalu. I've never went back there. I cursed that place. It was the destruction of my family and the killing of my brother. George's siblings went through life believing that this so-called confession had been coerced. They also knew that they couldn't change the past, but that didn't stop them from wanting to clear their brother's name. Aim had looked at getting the help of an attorney and even tried to contact Oprah Winfrey, but neither avenue got her anywhere. But then, George Frierson enters the story. This George is a local historian and member of the Board of Trustees for Clarendon School District. Frierson was born in Alkaloo, and he attended elementary school while the lumberyard was still in operation. Frierson took an interest in George's case after he found an old newspaper clipping of it in 2004. He started doing his own investigation, and the more information he looked at, the more certain he was that George Stinney was innocent. The biggest thing for this was the location of the girls' bodies. As I mentioned earlier, Betty and Mary had been found in a soggy ditch, but there was not much blood at the scene. This suggested to Frierson that the girls were likely killed elsewhere and then placed in the ditch. Why does this matter? Well, remember the fact that George was 95 pounds at the time of the girls' murder. As Frierson put it, a 95-pound boy can't carry two dead bodies a quarter mile or more. Those girls were beaten to a pulp. There would have been a lot of blood. George Frierson's work then caught Steve McKenzie and Matt Burgess's attention. 
two attorneys from Coffee, Chandler, and McKenzie. They then took on the case on behalf of the Stinney family. Steve filed papers in October of 2013 requesting for George's verdict to be overturned. New evidence was then presented by Steve Madden, Professor of Criminal Procedure at Charleston School of Law, Miller Sheely. This evidence included Charles and Ames' sworn statements that showed they were with George on the day the girls went missing. There was also the testimony of someone who was in prison with George, Wilford Hunter, known as Johnny. Johnny testified that George had told him that he was forced to confess. Ames says her story hasn't changed in the 70 years from when everything happened to when she was at this 2013 hearing. Prosecutors, however, accused her of not remembering details from a statement she gave in 2009, but Ames said the events of March 24, 1944 are so clear in her mind since no white people came around to their side of town. Ames and George had been sitting on the railroad tracks outside their home when the girls came up to them and asked where they could find Maypops. The kids then replied no and the girls left. We didn't see those girls no more, but somebody followed those girls and killed them. Matt Burgess was convinced that George's supposed confession was changed to fit the prosecution's case. The confession changed to fit the elements. The murder weapon changed. It was a piece of iron, then a spike, and then a railroad spike. That changed in a manner beneficial to law enforcement. In 1944, a 14-year-old black kid interrogated by white officers. They probably put different scenarios to him. I'm guessing he just said, yes sir, a lot. In January of 2014, at Sumter County Courthouse, Circuit Judge Carmen Mullen was presented the evidence and given the power to decide whether George had received a fair trial. It is important to note that her job was not to establish whether he was guilty or not. At Sumter County Courthouse in January, Circuit Judge Carmen Mullen stressed that her job was not to establish the guilt or innocence of George Stinney, who may well have committed this crime, but to determine whether or not he received a fair trial. Carmen was quoted as saying, no one can justify a 14-year-old child charged, tried, convicted, and executed in some 80 days. There were many injustices in George's case, and these are just some that Carmen would mention. A witness who found the bodies was allowed to sit in the coroner's inquest. The trial that lasted less than a day, and the complete lack of defense from Charles Plowden. In essence, not much was done for this child when his life lay in the balance. Some white members of Alkaloo weren't pleased to hear of the attempt to overturn George's conviction, one being Sadie Duke, who told a local newspaper in January 2014 that George had told her and a friend, if you don't get away from here and if you ever come back, I will kill you, a day before the murders. Another local who was a teenager at the time said George was a known bully. When asked about this, Ames said, the only white kids that came in our area was those kids. We had our own black school and church. We didn't fool around with white people. Alkaloo's black community said it was unlikely that in a town like Alkaloo back in the 40s, a black child would threaten white children. Members of Alkaloo's black community say that it was unlikely that, in the very segregated town, any black child would threaten white children without there being repercussions. After months of consideration, Judge Carmen Mullen vacated George's murder conviction on December 17, 2014. She called his death sentence, Great and Fundamental Injustice. This news was what George's siblings had wanted all along. It was like a cloud just moved away, said George's sister, Catherine. When we got the news, we were sitting with friends. I threw my hands up and said, thank you, Jesus. Someone had to be listening, is what we wanted for all these years. While this ruling came 70 years too late and the injustice of George Stinney Jr. being put to death will never be righted, his name has at least been cleared. It's scary to think that this didn't happen all that long ago.